take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which includes the, includes the Siksika, the Kikuni, the Kainai, the Sutina, and the Stony Nakoda First Nations, including the Chiniki, uh, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nation Five. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta, region number three, and thank you to everyone for allowing us to be here. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Suzette Meyer, and I'll be the MC for tonight, and I am a co-organizer of this symposium, along with Larissa Lai, Ben Groh, Micah, and Micah Jacobson. Um, but what you should know is that this symposium is the brainchild of Larissa Lai, who has organized a number of history-making events and symposia as part of Tea House, and it's just been so wonderful. Is she? Here? She went to get some water. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so this this is even better. So the thing about Larissa is that she's like a character from the 1930s musical movie starring Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney because she's totally one of those people who says out of the blue, I know, let's put on a show! <laughs> Except she says, let's put on a symposium! And if you're me, I say, okay. Do you have any money? And she says, yes. And I say, yay. <laughs> so here we are today. Um, and you can't help but get swept up in her enthusiasm and passion and wisdom. This is yay, about yay. you. Yay, yay, yay. <laughs> because ultimately, what a marvelous event and what a great idea, Black Lives Out West. Um, this wonderful chance to focus on black and indigenous art, relationship, and scholarship on Turtle Island. I was talking with Amal Madibo today, and uh, we were talking about how this is a historical event, I think, for Alberta, certainly. So it's just wonderful. So tonight's reading is the beginning of what I know will be a robust and amazing 24 hours of discussion, debate, provocation, and hopefully it will be an opportunity to build fruitful relationships and practices. So we have three readers tonight, David Chariandi, Cheryl Fogo, and Rain Prudhomme Cranford. And we'll begin with David Chariandi. Uh, David Chariandi grew up in Toronto and lives and teaches in Vancouver. His debut novel, Sukuyan, received stunning reviews and nominations from 11 literary awards journeys juries rather, including a Governor General's Award, Governor General's Literary Award shortlist, a Gold Independent Publisher Award for Best Novel, and the Scotiabank Giller Prize long list. His second novel, Brother, just came out and just won the Rogers Writers Trust Fiction Prize. Ooh. Ooh. So much, Suzette. Um, it's really such an honor to be here. Um, so many people to thank, um, Larissa, um, of course, and Suzette. Um, really, uh, you know, I don't very often get to uh, read in front of um, or in a context that I find you know this inspiring. And so, thank you very much. I feel profoundly honored to be here. Um, I feel tremendously honored to be reading with Cheryl and Rain. And um, it's also been amazing to see so many people I haven't seen for a long time um, in so many different contexts. It's really <laughs> funny that, how uh, I've connected with so many of you um, and just, um, uh, I don't know, just um, had this opportunity to, to be together with you again. Um, it feels a bit, like, um, a bit like coming home. So I'm going to read... Um, a bit from uh, my, my latest novel. I'll read um, the prologue and then maybe uh, another passage uh, a bit later in my book. And um, I'll read the prologue, which is very short. It was um, the, the image uh, that came to me first when I, maybe 10 years ago, when I first tried to. Um, Try to write, and uh, in this image, uh, there are two uh, young boys, brothers, and the youngest is speaking. Once, 
he showed me his place in the sky. That hydro hole in a parking lot, all weed broke and abandoned. Looking up, you'd see the dangers of the climb. The feeder lines on insulators, the wired bucket called a pole pig, the footholds rusted bad and going way into the sky cut hard by live cables. You'd hear the electricity as you moved higher, he warned me. Feel it shivering your teeth and lighting a whole city of fear inside your head. But if you made it to the top, he said, you were good. All that free air and seeing. The streets below, suddenly patterns you could read. A great lookout, my brother told me. One of the best in the neighborhood that step badly on a line, <coughs> touch your hand with the wrong metal part while you're brushing up against another, and you burn, hang, scarecrow stiff and smoking in the air, dead black sight for all. You want to go out like that, he asked. So when you climbed, he said, you had to go careful. You had to watch your older brother and follow close his moves. You had to think back on every step before you took it, remembering hard the whole way up. He taught me that, my older brother. Memories got nothing to do with the old and the gray and the far away gone. Memories the muscle sting of now, a kid reaching brave in the skull hung with power. And if you can't memory right, he said, you lose. Okay, so I'll just read a little later from the novel, and I think, I think that will, yeah, that will be it. So this, uh, the novel is set in, um, in a suburb um, uh, of Toronto. Um, I think you'll recognize it. The world around us was named Scarborough. It had once been called Scarberia, a wasteland on the outskirts of a sprawling city. But now, as we were growing up in the early 80s, in the heated language of a changing nation, we heard it called other names. Scarlum, Scarboristan. We lived in Scarborough, a suburb that had mushroomed up and yellowed, browned, and blackened into life. Our neighbors were Mrs. Chandrasekhar and Mr. Chow, Pilar Fernandez and Clyde Sonny Barrington. They spoke different languages, they ate different foods, but they were all from one colony or the other, and so they had a shared vocabulary for describing feral children like us. We were ragamuffins. <laughs> we were hooligans, <laughs> up to no good gallivanting. <coughs> We were what one neighbor, more poet than security guard, described as oiled creatures of mongoose cunning, <laughs> raiding dumpsters in garbage rooms, or climbing up trees and fire exit stairs to spy on adults. During winters, we snowballed cars on Lawrence Avenue, dipping into the back alleys if the drivers tried to pursue us. A pinto wagon went shaving past my face, its wake tugging hard upon my body. Francis's hand upon my shoulder, pulling me safe. Uh, Francis is the name of the older brother. During the day, we had more formal educational opportunities. Our school was named after Sir Alexander Campbell, a father of confederation. But we, the students of his school, had our own confederations, our own schoolyard territories and alliances, our own trade agreements and anthems. We listened to Planet Rock and carried Adidas bags and wore stonewashed <laughs> jeans and painter caps. You could hear us whenever there were general assemblies in the auditorium, our collective voices overwhelming whatever politely seated ceremony we were supposed to be attending. Hey Francis, homeboy, my man. Rude boy, Francis, gang star. Francis and I each served out long sentences in classrooms beneath the chemical hum of white fluorescent lights in part out of fear of our mother, who warned us, upon pain of something worse than death, 
not to squander our only chance. But Francis actually liked to learn. He read books, and he was a good observer. And after class was out, there were other institutions to learn from. A dozen blocks west of the towers and housing complexes of the park, at the intersection of Mark and Lawrence, there lay a series of strip malls. There were grocery shops selling spices and herbs and signs in foreign languages and scripts, vegetables and fruits with vaguely familiar names like Aki and Edo. There were restaurants with an average expiry date of a year. There were hand-painted signs promising ice cream with the back-home tastes of mango and koya and madam kofi. A second sign written urgently in red marker promising they'd also serve, whenever asked, the mystery of Canadian food. <laughs> <laughs> also, the Heritage Value convenience store, run by that asshole who framed his useless foreign degree, despised the dark sticking guts of every other immigrant, and bullied his wife and two daughters into endless hours at the cash register, advertising lottery tickets and more phone rates to Kingston and Saigon and Colombo and Port of Spain. The father hated Francis and me, recognizing the look of no money on our faces. We had little chance of sneaking into his store when he was working, but if his wife or daughters were on shift, we might slip in and buy a few singles of Double Bubble and maybe a pack of three flavored fun dip. We'd scope out the freezer section with its Klondike bars and Eskimo pies frosted thick with crystals. The price is always out of reach. We might even be allowed to steal a few moments at the comic book display, pretending to debate a buy, but actually reading as quickly as possible. Those stories of heroes masked and misread, their secret origins, their endless war with darkest evil. Francis had nightmares. He'd be lying in the bunk above me, and I'd listen to his breathing, the soft wheeze he might have from allergies or cold. He'd be on the edge of sleep when some terror would visit him. He'd wake screaming a deep body scream, all cracked throat and emptied stomach, and it would take me a while to realize that I'd been screaming too. If Mother was home, she'd offer comfort. She'd lie beside us, and with the warmth of her body push back the fear. We'd lie quiet and awake, the three of us for a long time, watching the wind blow ghosts into the great drapes. And cars passing by on the avenue cast moving lights on the walls and ceiling, never speaking, listening for things. What scares two boys aged 10 and 11? Sometimes, in the midst of our play, a siren would cut the air, and cars with flashing lights would break screeching on the avenue. The neighborhood kid soon cuffed on the sidewalk, his face turned away from us in shame. There were tales about boys jumped and beaten, faces ruined, jaws wired shut. I saw it myself, claimed one. I did it, claimed another. Mm -hmm. And we were never sure if either ought to be believed. Mm -hmm. Always there were stories on TV and in the papers of gangs, killings in bad neighborhoods, predators roaming close. One morning I peered with Francis into a newspaper box to read a headline about the latest terror and caught in the glass the reflection of our own faces. Mm. From the age of seven, Francis could read. He read books, of course, regularly and well into his teens, but he could also read the many signs and gestures around us. He could read the faces of the neighborhood youth hanging around outside the 7-Eleven and know when to offer a nod or else a sly joke or else just to keep moving and not just then attempt to meet a bruised pair of eyes. But especially, Francis could read our mother. He recognized her pride, but also the roots and tolls of her labors. He knew that for work as a cleaner, sometimes a nanny, she had not only tough hours, but also long journeys, complicated rides along bus routes to faraway office buildings and malls and homes, long waits at odd hours at stops and stations, sometimes in the rain or in the thick heat of the afternoon, sometimes in the cold and dark of winter. He understood that there is a specific moment during the trip back home from work when a mother's body threatens to give out, a specific sight 
in the bus loop at Kennedy Station when exhaustion closes in and the limbs feel like meat and it takes every last strength from a mother to make the two additional bus transfers home. When Francis was still not quite a teen and mother returned home in a state, he would go to work. He would casually offer her a cool damp cloth for her head, maybe even a pan of water and Epsom salts for her feet. He would fetch a blanket in winter or a fan and a glass of water in summer. He was never, he was careful never to overdo his concern and so wound her pride, or otherwise to break any of the household rules she had established to help us through new times. But one hot summer day, when mother collapsed on a couch, shaking her head at all offered food, unwilling to take a sip of water or even to open her eyes, 12-year-old Francis dared big. He went to the kitchen and took from the freezer a can of orange juice concentrate. He had been warned repeatedly by mother never to touch the stuff without her permission. And if she allowed us to touch it, we were to use five cans of water to dilute the concentrate. <laughs> Never three is the full instructions on cancer. <laughs> but on that day, Francis used just one can of water, mashing it into the frozen mashing it into the frozen lump of concentrate with a wooden spoon and pouring the slush bright into a glass. He gently lowered the glass into mother's curled fingers, her eyes still closed. A grace for all hell to break loose as she tasted, her mouth moving as if eating pudding. I made it sweet this time, explained Francis. Sweet, mother said, the tired smile. She touched his face. She cupped his chin and touched the growing shadow of his mustache. She pinched his earlobe lightly between her thumb and finger as if it were a raindrop from a leaf, mm -hmm. and then reached to gently pluck something from his hair, a burr from the rouge volley. Um, is that enough? Do you, <laughs> you know, people say that, but then... <laughs> that, was, that was 15 minutes. Okay, then that's enough. Really good, thank you. Thank you. Our next reader is Cheryl Fogo. Cheryl Fogo is a descendant of the black pioneers of Alberta and Saskatchewan. She is an award-winning writer who's been published and produced extensively in multiple genres. John Ware Reimagined won the 2015 Writers Guild of Alberta Gwen Ferris Ringwood Award for, Award for Drama. In 2014, Cheryl co-produced Alberta's first Black Canadian Theatre series with Ellipsis Tree Collective Theatre Company. She is currently in production with the National Film Board of Canada on the documentary film John Ware Reclaimed, due fall of 2018. And you've got John Ware Reimagined in Edmonton right now, right? It just closed. It just closed. So, please join me in welcoming Cheryl. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Larissa, for inviting me. David, thank you so much. That that went deep. I don't often yes. say this, but I could have listened quite a bit. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so I, I'm going to provide a little bit of context, and I am actually going to read from John Ware Reimagined, the play. Uh, forgive me if there are those of you who do know who John Ware was. But for those who don't, he was a, an African-American cowboy who arrived in southern Alberta, well before it was the place that we now call Alberta, in 1882. And <clears throat> he was a, an incredible individual for a lot of different reasons. He ended up being quite successful as a rancher and uh, was most famous for his skills as a horseman, I would say. But he was famous enough that there are seven geographical locations named for him in Alberta, including two here in Calgary, John Ware Junior High School and uh, the Four Nines Dining Room at Sate, 
is named for his brand, his first brand, the Four Nights, and eventually became the Three Nights. So I started working on, uh, I started putting my John Ware files to work in 2012 when the centennial of the stampede was being held because I wanted him to be remembered during that year-long celebration even though he died in 1905 and didn't live long enough to see the stampede become a thing. And <clears throat> I um, will eventually produce a trilogy of works about John Ware. So the first was the play, John Ware Reimagined. The second is a film I'm about three quarters of the way finished shooting. It's called John Ware Reclaimed. And the book will be John Ware Re-something. <laughs> <laughs> I was born in Calgary. I grew up in Calgary at a time when the only identity for any Calgarian was to do with the stampede. So I grew up with that whole mythology of horses and cowboys, and my brother and I embraced it fully, and then um, eventually began to not see ourselves reflected in the popular cultural depictions of that world, and began to feel uncomfortable, and eventually even maybe unsafe, um, placing ourselves within that mythology. My brother was in grade six, I believe, when he went to the Glenbow Museum for the first time and discovered that <clears throat> the greatest cowboy of all time, probably anywhere in the world, was a person of African descent, as we were. And that was a shocking revelation because we had actually heard the name John Ware, and we just didn't know that he was a black cowboy. And that was a, a life-altering moment for me, and I hope goes a little way toward explaining why I'm obsessed with John Ware and why I feel I have to reimagine, reclaim, and re-something. <laughs> <laughs> His mythology has been... Um, John Ware is thought of in some ways, in, in a way that is both reverent but also a racist. And so I've just made it my business to reclaim and reimagine and re revise, rewrite, whatever it's going to be, his story. So uh, just a, a, a little bit of context. There are three characters in the play. One is a, a woman named Joni who's based on my life. And we see Joni as a seven-year-old, as a preteen, a teenager, and then as an adult woman. Um, the other two characters are John and Mildred. I'm going to read a very short monologue of Joni's, adult Joni. The wonderful actor who plays the part of Joni on stage uh, does a very credible seven-year-old and 12-year-old and 14-year-old <laughs> Joni. I am not going to attempt any of those. And then a short monologue of John's, and then I'll finish with one of Mildred. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> Over several decades, my rituals have evolved. I shamelessly attend stampede breakfasts and barbecues, feeling smug because I live in the only city in Canada where you can eat free for a whole week. <laughs> and I still go down to the grounds. I visit the barns without holding my hand over my nose. The horses stomp and snort, and I remember paint and buttermilk. I eat a hot dog on a stick and the little donuts after going on one ride, that cable car thing that carries you slowly and gently from the pot of gold to the big four building. This year, I add a new ritual. I stand in front of that building that has been there for as long as I can remember that was named for the four men who branded my city. I look up at those big square letters and imagine that they say, the big five. It's possible that I've read every document with John Ware's name on it. I've searched dozens of dusty old books. I've read his daughter's letters. Did he strap himself to a wagon and pull the three people in at home when their horses were killed by lightning? Did he discover oil in Alberta? Did a wild horse he was riding buck itself off a cliff into the river below and did he rise up out of the river still in the saddle? Mm -hmm. I want to be the one that finds him. Take a giant 
magic eraser and swipe it across everything that has ever been said about him, cleansing the page, edging closer to what's true. For today, here's what I've got. He was smart, he was funny, he hated fences. <laughs> <clears throat> this is John. My life was divided into four. Four times, and each time better than the one previous. When I was a boy, and till I was a young man, somebody owned me. Somebody said they owned me. That was time one. Only good thing to say for time one is, I learned my place, top of the world, sitting in a saddle on top of the world. If you let a horse teach you, you'll know what you need to do and when you need to do it for the rest of your life. A horse will teach you the only thing you'll ever need, balance, how to hold on. Then there's music. There's lots of music. <laughs> Um, he goes on. Time too came after we managed to get free. Well, I was better off than some. I could ride and rope. And there was no shortage of that kind of work, work that got me out of the South. Of course, I always took a lot of ribbon whenever I hired on with a new outfit, even after I'd come up here. And they always thought I was hard of hearing too and couldn't hear him whispering. Oh, look at this big old boy. Green horn. Oh, look here now. Boss is giving him Satan to ride. Hope he doesn't break his neck. Mm -hmm. They'd figure on teaching my uppity self a lesson for asking to join the crew by giving me the meanest horse in the corral. I always went along, playing dumb. Mm -hmm. uh, what are these things here? Stirrups, you call them. <laughs> what are they for? Every cowboy on the drive would be gathered around by the time I was finished my song. <laughs> they couldn't wait to see how quick I was going to get my tail bounced off a bronc that not one of them had been able to stick. But when I set my foot in that stirrup and swung myself up in the saddle, that was my glory. Up on a horse, the wilder the better. That was my glory. By the time I got through riding that son of a gun to a standstill, the grins was wiped off their faces. Of course, I climbed down and laugh it off, shaking hands all around. All round. Aw, oh, dang, fellas, I knew you was just funnin'. But later on, when it was sleep time, and nobody was looking, it's my turn to grin. Mm -hmm. That's John. How's my time? Um, we got loads. Another okay. five minutes. Okay. <clears throat> this is Mildred. I.G. Baker, Mercantile and Grocery. The tang of cloth and apples and liniment and leather all mixed up together and handed to you on a plate. Like, here, Mildred, this is going to be your life now. The whole thing stank of expectations, and I'd spent my life meeting people's expectations. I was the oldest girl of ten siblings. If my brothers and sisters got to running around, it was always, Mildred, can't you keep those children quiet? Well, they're your children, not mine. I felt like saying that, but I never did. I just went along with what was expected. I liked noise. The first night we spent out here, I thought my ears were broken. <laughs> the street I grew up on in Toronto, King Street, was busy. The taxis, horses running back and forth, the church bells, people shouting, morning, to their neighbors. And everything was right there. If you forgot something at the dry goods, you turned around and went back for it. Here. If you forgot something, you may do without. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get back in the wagon and drive 60 miles because you forgot the broom. My great-grandfather, Daniel Lewis, was free. His son, Henry Lewis, my grandfather, was free. They'd been chased out of Virginia because Henry had the gall to buy my grandmother's freedom, and they fled to Toronto. Grandpa Henry was a carpenter, but in the winter he harvested, harvested ice and sold it all over the city. Oh, I love that ice cart. Uncle William used to lift me up, 
wrap me in Grandma Francis's old fur coat and let me hold the horse's reins while he carried the ice into his customers. That's as close as I ever got to a horse in Toronto. My Uncle John owned the Dominion Tobacco Works Company and had 75 men working for him. And then he became a lawyer. Uncle Henry was a member of the York Pioneers. Uncle Benjamin ran the bakery and the sausage shop. The Lewises owned so many homes and businesses in Toronto, I started to feel like a queen riding around in that ice car. Look at me. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Why leave his carpentry business in our two-story brick house on King Street and our aunts and uncles and cousins and a whole community of colored people who are educating their children in Latin mm -hmm. to come out here to try to grow rocks? I didn't understand. I went along as expected. And here it was. Here I was. It was a terrible wrench, but I had my plans. As soon as I had enough money and Jesse got old enough to help with the younger children, I was going back to Toronto to become a school teacher. I was tired of the kind of expectations that had dropped me in a wasteland where the most exciting part of every day was scraping chicken droppings off my good shoes. Mm. And the prejudice, that was a wrench too. Not that there wasn't prejudice in the East, but you could, we had our own spaces. But every person I met was talking about this John Ware. Have you met John Ware, Miss Lewis? They'd take one look at me. Say now, there's a fellow you've just got to meet, Miss Lewis. And then Mother started talking about we should meet this John Ware. I knew what she was thinking, too. People in my family didn't just marry, they made good matches. Mm -hmm. It was the Lewis way. Mm -hmm. I reminded Mother of my plans to return to Toronto. Well, no harm in meeting the man, honey, she said. Might as well make the acquaintance of all the good colored folks we can while we're here. After all the good colored folks we left behind in Toronto. <laughs> I narrowed my eyes behind her back whenever she talked about him. I was determined to dislike him. <laughs> One day I went to I.G. Baker with Mother to buy muslin to make new curtains, and there he was. <coughs> Big. <laughs> Clean. Not rough and smelly, like I've been picturing. <laughs> he had a presence, big hands, big shoulders. He was really big. <laughs> so I thought to myself, well, Mother's right. There's no harm. <laughs> so I did. I said, hello. Um, do you think it might rain like everyone's saying it's about to do? And he opened his mouth, but nothing came out. He looked like he was about to faint. He was just so big. But then when he didn't speak, didn't even respond beyond nodding his head a couple of times, I thought, well, you're big, but is that all? <laughs> the next time I saw him was at a social at the McCutcheon's place, where he wasn't much better. Finally, when it got late and I was making to leave, he followed me out to the porch and said, Ms. Lewis, careful on that step now. But there was a loose board on the stair. I turned back and said, thank you, Mr. Ware. I will. I couldn't stop looking at him. I said to myself, Mildred, you are in trouble. Mm -hmm. And I went home and sat down in the dirt behind the hen house and cried for three hours. Because what about my life? Mm -hmm. What about my plans? Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Bonjour, 
Pomo, Halito Saho Chipo, Ukraine for Dominic Cranford. Chi Okla po Holiso Holipota, Umtuklo, Chukayakini, Yokoke, Nisi. Hi, I'm Ukraine for Cranford. I want to thank the people whose homelands are Treaty 7. Um, thank you for letting me live here and work here. Um, thank you to Larissa and Suzette and Ben and, <laughs> and Micah. Um, and I'm kind of very nervous because this is the worst position to be in. <laughs> David and Cheryl, y'all are amazing and inspiring. And Nicole Kimasi, thank you for just letting me be with you. <laughs> so I really... I'm honored. Um, so I'm going to read a couple poems and hopefully not bore you. So, <laughs> um, my father is a Choctaw Biloxi, Louisiana Creole, and a uh, freedman. For those unfamiliar, um, the freedmen are black and Indian descendants of slaves in Oklahoma. Um, his mother is a descendant of the Ch Choctaw and Chickasaw Freedmen. His father is Louisiana Creole, which are black Indian and uh, Latinidad folks of Louisiana and the Gulf South, um, and also Choctaw Biloxi. Um, my mother, uh, his father is a residential school survivor. <laughs> from here in Canada, who grew up in Wetaskiwin, and her mother was first generation Irish American. Give you two guesses who I take after. Mm. <laughs> so, I rarely read from this, because I don't like it. <laughs> but I thought tonight might be a good night to read one. <clears throat> Do you want, do you want me to oh. <laughs> I'm going to take care of this, right? <laughs> okay, so is that good? Is that That's good. Oh, it wasn't that? Well, it was, but it was good. Okay. 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 And now I'll do a dance. <laughs> <laughs> so this is called Taking Back My Tongue. For Granddaddy, Papa, Mom, and Dad. This tongue be memory, this tongue be taste, this tongue be testament to the colonizer's victory over my language. Mm -hmm. This tongue be resistance, scarred, still bloody, resown, <clears throat> renewed, relearning. Tasting sorrow, dry tears, in my head that can't fall. So much salt in my skin from bloody crusted wounds, the waters and airs of my youth, humid afternoon showers, going to fish and crab in the morning for supper, salty smoked mullet, smooth and biting, cornbread, grainy and sweet. <coughs> Can't shake the salt, the hot, sticky heat from blood, memories and sleep. I am absent. I am missing. <laughs> I can still taste smoke. Ten years gone, but marble and tequila still dance in my mouth, whispering of late nights, of guitars, tribal policies, politics, two-step, his skinnered, my bougie Chavez. Dance with a shadow at 4 a.m. Where flowering buds release memory in my mouth. Because I still remember, I still miss smoke. This tongue been cut. This tongue been split. It's more than tripping over language. Inadequate square phrases fall short. Bridges of inconsequence. See? This tongue was rewritten, cut out, separated into divisions. Granddaddy Indian and Creole hide his nappy Choctaw Creek head. Indoctrination, 
retrain that swamp engine tongue bit bloody by Jim Crow and the military. Mm -hmm. Papa, Canadian Métis, got his tongue cut out by nuns in residential school. Bloody-lipped border crosser. My grandpa's tongues are keloid maps of memory. My tongue learned its place in the topography of taste. Tongue leaking taste to story, to place, and me somewhere in the middle, listening to the flavor of the sound of family before taking back my tongues, our tongues, taking back, taking back, taking back, taking back our tongue. So this is actually really new, and um, maybe if it <laughs> will show up, work technology. So I was sitting in my moo, -moo as I am wont to do any time that's past like 7 o'clock, <laughs> <laughs> with my pets, because I am the old lady who lives in her moo, -moo with pets. <laughs> and all this ish was going down with, you know, the crazy maniacal guy south of us running a country. And there were... Earth, the earthquake, another earthquake had just happened. We had fires here in Alberta and British Columbia um, in California, Montana. <clears throat> um, the hurricane was heading towards my family um, and then other relatives who had more relatives in Puerto Rico. And I was born in the 70s and grew up in the 80s and the 90s. I thought, gee, didn't Michael Stipe talk about this? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and I have, I kind of have a love affair with pontoons and bops. So um, this is called when Michael Stipe was prophet. In my flannel and combat boots, it starts with an earthquake. Side armed with guitar, fingers splayed, cross chords we sing round bonfires. It starts with an earthquake, eye of hurricane, we circle counterclockwise, cross chords we sing around bonfires. Skip hop melody, watch gods turn back time. Eye of hurricane, we circle counterclockwise. Shed smartphones, loosen our Gen X memories, skip hop melodies, watch gods turn back time, book burning, bloodletting. Shed smartphones, loosen our Gen X memories, side armed with guitar, fingers splayed, book burning, bloodletting, in my flannel and combat boots. That's right, <laughs> <laughs> So I'll do two more and we'll call it a night. <laughs> this is called Dust Bowl Blues. Black thorn pierced naked foot, bleed red. Overhead black crow, blue tinged wings. Trip on broken branch. Broken branch, no spring bud, magnolias to bruise broken in Billy's hair. Broken notes slip past lips, trembling timpani. Trembling timpani rumble call, thunder come down memory, like sermon brimstone trembling. Dredge, lake, sludge, corpse rotting, this is what we buried. Broken branch trembling like timpani under wary perched black crow, tinged blue as bruise, and this black thorn bleeds red on Oklahoma dust. <laughs> I have this new fat poem, but they're swearing and I'm trying to mind myself. 
Um, you can swear. We're over 18. It's all good. And then I also, um, let's see. And I usually do one of the pantoons with singing, so <clears throat> let me try. I'm going to try to do that. So, so I've, I apologize in advance. Um, so this is called Levy Wound Blues. And it's a pontoon um, that uses uh, music from uh, When the Levee Breaks by Memphis Millie. Um, I name for falling waters mindful balance. If it keeps on raining, the levee gonna break. Rising like his hand up my skirt, nails welting flesh, raises keloid banks like bodies, death memory ridges. If it keeps on raining, the levee's gonna break. Rolling waves of music slapping flesh. Rippling stories raises keloid banks like bodies, death memory ridges. Gripped by his tumble and thrust, riding my broken bruises. Rolling waves of music slapping flesh, ripple stories. Whispering prayers to Cynthia Lapita and Tambala. Gripped by his tumble and thrust, riding my broken bruises. A crown won't help you. And prayer won't do you no good. Whispering prayers to Cindy Lapita and Dambala, womb walls break, tumbling down scarlet water. A cry won't help you, and praying won't do you no good. Child. Safety of water, washing away another man's sin. Womb walls break. Tumbling down scarlet water, white sins worked on red, black body leave blues. Safety of water, washing away another man's sin. Got what it take to make a bayou gal leave at home. White skins worked on red, black bodies leave blue. Rising like his hand up my skirt. Nails welting flesh. God, what it take to make a bayou got leave her home? And I'm still named for waters, mindful balance. Mm -hmm.